He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is a verse that we need to get into our heads. It's also the one of the most misquoted, misinterpreted, and misused verses in the Bible. I'm just going to pull out a little soapbox here and stand up on it. You'll hear people tell you, or you will hear other people say, you may even say it yourself. I hope not. Well, God will never give you anything that you can't handle. And then we'll talk about this verse. God is faithful. He won't give you anything beyond what you can handle. <clears throat> I'm sorry. If you say that, if you believe that, if you hear other people saying that, they are totally misusing this verse. This verse is specifically talking about temptation and sin. You will never be tempted beyond what you can handle. You will never be tempted that God will not provide a way of escape so that you can avoid the temptation. And yes, God will give you things in your life you cannot handle because He wants you to come to Him. He can handle them. You can't. So when you get those things that you have trouble handling, go to God. That's what He wants to begin with. But God will provide a way of escape. Another way to put this is that you always have a choice. <clears throat> you always have a choice. This is given to us. With God's instruction in Genesis 2, 15 through 17. Go ahead and back up there, Jim. Yeah. Genesis 2, 15 through 17. God is talking with Adam and Eve. And he, the Lord God took the man, placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the day you eat of it, you will certainly die. God gave his instructions. See, you always have a choice, but God gave his instructions. Eat. Eat anything you want. Except for that one tree over there. That's the one you keep your hands off of. The rest of them, you can eat, you can enjoy, you can have fun. You can eat to your heart's content. Just leave that one alone. And I've heard people say, well, <clears throat> why wouldn't God want us to know the difference between good and evil? That's an easy question. Once you know the difference between good and evil, you know the difference between sin and not sinning. And you know when you make the wrong choice, you've committed sin. That breaks and snaps and separates you from God. Because He cannot be in the presence of sin. Sin is what separates us from God. And so He doesn't want you to sin. That's why He gives instructions. That's why God gives us boundaries. God's boundaries always enrich us. They are there to protect us. When I was a kid, long ago, I would have other kids in school inviting me to all the parties where they would drink and they would do drugs and they would have fun in their opinion and they say why don't you come why won't you do this and I said well for one thing none of that stuff is good for you okay I don't know if you've forgotten eighth grade health class but I haven't all that stuff's not good for you why would I want to ingest something that's bad for me I got enough problems as it is but number two God tells me I'm not supposed to do that well, why won't God let you have any fun? No, 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 no. God's not, God's boundaries, <clears throat> excuse me, 
do not prevent us from having fun. God's boundaries are to protect us. God's boundaries will enrich us. God's boundaries allow us to become all that we're supposed to be. You look at our world today. It has problems. Just in case you weren't aware of that. One major problem <clears throat> is with sexually transmitted diseases. Do you know that if everyone did sex God's way between a man and a woman who are married for life, sexually transmitted diseases would virtually disappear overnight. And it's interesting, about five, seven years ago, they came out and they said, we should not call them sexually transmitted diseases. Diseases sound bad. Diseases sound nasty. You know, the Black Plague was a disease. We should call them infections. Everybody gets infections. Everybody knows what an infection is. Infections are easy to take care of, usually. Infections aren't that. They don't carry the stigma that a disease carries. I'm sorry, it's a disease. They are diseases. Now, are you destined to go to hell if you have one of these sexually transmitted diseases? No. What sent what? sends you to hell is your refusal to accept Jesus as your Savior. That's it. You look at the boundaries that God gives us. He gives us boundaries for everything. For sex. He gives us boundaries for alcohol. In the scriptures, it says don't drink to excess. It says don't get drunk. The biggest problem with alcohol is the percentage of people that can control their drinking without it going to excess, without it getting, is a very tiny percentage. And so it's best, this is my opinion, this is not scripture, this is my opinion, it's best to avoid it altogether. Because you cannot drink to excess if you do not drink. Just, you know, just an idea, throwing it out there. You know, God gives us boundaries for our benefit to protect us. Most of you have heard this before, but this is the best example that I can think of, that I can come up with to explain how God's boundaries enrich us. They enable us to become all that we were created to be. Many of you are familiar with the concept or you've seen the videos and you've heard of the bullet trains in Japan. 200 miles an hour. And away they go. They're amazing. You can travel from one end of Japan to the other in just a few hours. But you know, those bullet trains are very restricted. They have tracks that they have to stay on. They have boundaries that they cannot go outside because if those bullet trains are zipping along at 200 miles an hour and that train decides, you know, I don't like the restrictions of these boundaries, these rails that I'm on. I want to go look at this over here and head off the track. You have a train wreck. And what happens to many people's lives when they ignore God's boundaries and they say, I want to go over here and do what I want. I don't care what God says. Their life becomes a train wreck. The comedian, even that's the technical title, even though I don't find her all that funny, Amy Schumer. <clears throat> she put out a movie a few years back that was loosely based around what a mess her life has been. And the movie was entitled Trainwreck. When you get outside of God's boundaries, 
You're inviting your life to become a train wreck. God gives us these boundaries. What happened to Adam and Eve when they decided to get outside of God's boundaries? They doomed every one of us. God's boundaries always enhance our lives. They do not limit it. Parents, you set boundaries for your children. You can't go over there. You can't cross the highway. You can't walk around the block without an adult. You can't talk to strangers. You can't drive a car alone until you have your license. You can't do all of these things. You have a curfew. Why do we set boundaries as parents? Is it because we enjoy being mean to our children? Maybe. No, it's because that's what's best for them. And that's why God sets boundaries for us. It's because it's what's best for us. But just like our kids keep trying to break the boundaries parents set, we keep trying to break the boundaries God sets as our Heavenly Father. Here's an example of how God's boundaries work in Numbers chapter 33. 33, verses 51 to 55. Numbers chapter 33. <clears throat> Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you cross the Jordan River into the land of Canaan, you must drive out all the people living there. You must destroy all their carved and molten images and demolish all their pagan shrines. But if you fail to drive out the people who live in the land, those who remain will be like splinters in your eyes and thorns in your side. They will harass you in the land where you live. Now, in case you have not read your Bible, shame on you, you'll know when the people of Israel went into the Promised Land, in Joshua, and in Judges, they did not drive out all the people. They did not destroy all their idols and all their images. And they became a snare for all of Israel. If everyone of God's people had done everything the way God commanded when they went into the Promised Land, our Bible would probably have ended, our Old Testament would definitely have ended with Joshua. Because everything the rest of the way through is the result of them not doing what God told them before they went into the land. God set the boundaries. And they didn't follow Him. And the rest of the Old Testament is about the train wreck of Israel and Judah and the problems they had for centuries. Now, let me talk for a few minutes about just simply temptation. This is where we get into trouble is when we start giving into temptation. So let me talk about temptation. In Genesis 3, 1 through 5, Right after God had given them their instructions. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden. But about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. See, there's her first mistake. She added to what God said. God didn't say they couldn't touch it. Now, that's probably a good idea because you can't eat it if you don't touch it. That might have been an addition that Adam had made. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
That doesn't sound like a bad idea, being like God. Humanity has been trying to be like God since then. You see, Satan will come and push your boundaries. God will set boundaries, but Satan will push your boundaries. You can be certain, once you decide to obey God or draw a boundary in your life, the devil is going to show up in your life and test that boundary. Again, when parents set boundaries for their children, their children often spend time testing those boundaries. Well, when it comes to serving God, Satan will try to get you to test your boundaries. It may be the voice of a friend. It may be the, a voice in your head. But Satan always shows up to get you to question the truth. And that's what he did here with Eve. He got her to question the truth. Did God really say, Oh, no, you won't die? You see, that's all that Satan can do. He has no power. Let me give you some truths about Satan. Some truths about the devil that people often misunderstand. First of all, he is not omnipotent. He is not all-powerful. Not even close. Satan is not omnipresent. He cannot be everywhere at once. These are attributes of God. These are not attributes of Satan. Now here's one that we like to ignore. <clears throat> he can't make you do anything. He can't force you to commit a sin. If he could force you to commit a sin, he would have forced Jesus to commit a sin, and that would have thrown everything, every bit of God's plan out the window. He can't make you do anything. He can, all he can do is make suggestions. Like he did with Eve, he made suggestions. Oh, you won't die. Did God really say that? And we come back to, you always have a choice. You always have a choice. James chapter 4, verse 7, explains about the choice and explains about what happens when we make that choice or when we make the right choices. Do you have that verse there pop up, please? James 4, 7. Therefore, submit to God. Give yourself to God. But resist the devil and he will flee from you. You see, Satan has got a little bit of smarts. And if you resist him, if you tell him no when he comes tempting you, and you tell him no, and you tell him no, it's going to be like he's hitting his head on a brick wall. Very few people enjoy that, including Satan. So after a while, he'll quit. And he'll leave you alone for a little while. Remember? When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, we have the three temptations recorded. And after the third time when Jesus told him no, it says Satan departed from Jesus for a little while. He came back. He tempted him throughout his life. We don't know a lot of the other temptations. But he came back. And he'll come back to you to see if you're still strong enough to resist, if you're still submitted to God. See, if you look throughout the Scripture, and the Scriptures don't tell us a lot about Satan. The Scriptures don't tell us much about Satan at all. 
But some of the things they do tell us is he is 100% subject to God. He can't do anything that God doesn't say, okay, give it a try. Read Job chapter 1. Satan appears before God. And God says, where you been? And Satan, because God is God, has to answer him. He says, I've been roaming to and fro all over the earth. And then when Satan wants to test Job, he has to get permission from God. Because God is God and Satan is just an underling, to put it simply. He's a minor annoyance to God. People talk about how powerful Satan is. Do you know how long, if God wanted to completely, totally eradicate Satan, how long would it take God to do it? That's too long. He could do it in less time than that. Because he's God. Satan, as we know from the temptations of Jesus, Satan knew the scriptures. And here's where Satan proves that he's not a very bright guy. The scriptures make it very clear. The prophecies of Isaiah 53 is throughout the rest of the Old Testament, the messianic prophecies, of which there are over 300 of them. They make it clear Jesus had to go to the cross and die to be raised again. Jesus told the disciples, I don't know how many times, the Son of Man has to go to Jerusalem, be betrayed, crucified, and die, and raised on the third day. There was no secret about this. Satan knew that. So what did Satan spend 30 years of Jesus' life doing? Trying to get him put on the cross. Satan knew that was his defeat. Satan should have done everything possible to make Jesus the king of this world and to keep him off the cross. But he didn't. Knowing that that was going to be his destruction. Again, what do we call it? Let's go back to the very first sentence. What do we call it when someone does something that's harmful that they know ahead of time is harmful and do it anyway. Generally, that person is a fool. But Satan is sneaky. There is no doubt about that. You have to resist him. You always have a choice. Let's talk about sin and its consequences for a few minutes. I want to read, continue reading from Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. The woman saw the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. We sin. Sin has consequences. We sin when we convince ourselves that the sin will give us something we want. We want something. And God has said no, but we want it anyway. So we're going to do whatever we can, whatever we need to, to be able to get it. Because it's what we want. And let's face it, if there's no, one thing that we humans are, it's selfish. I want what I want, when I want, because I want. And that's all that matters to me. We're very selfish and self-centered. Some more so than others. 
But when we get it, when we sin to get what we want, we think it will make us happy, but it never does. She saw the food, the fruit of the tree. It was good to look at. It was good for eating. And it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. She wanted wisdom. She wanted to be like God, like Satan promised. She wanted to know good from evil. She desired that. <clears throat> so she ate. And she learned what was good and evil. And when she learned that, what did it result in? The same thing sin results in for us today. Shame. It results in shame. She went. Adam went. They realized that they were naked. And they were ashamed. And they made themselves covers. Coverings. They were ashamed. When we sin, when we do, especially these sins that I'm talking about, that we constantly keep going back to, these sins that trip us up, these sins that bind us, these sins that we are constantly going back to. We sin and we feel shame. Which we should. We've broken God's law. How did Jesus respond when the sin of all humanity was placed upon him while he was on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He realized he was separated from God. For the first time in his entire existence, he was not walking hand in hand with his heavenly father. And he was frightened. And he was distressed. And he was hurting physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And he didn't commit the sin. He just got our sins put on him. If we go and commit the sin, if we go and break God's boundaries, if we go and say, God, I've decided I know better than you, and I'm going to go do this just because... Well, we should feel shame. We should feel shame. And what else comes with it? Secrecy. What did they do? They went and hid from God. When God came around, they hid from Him. Now, did it work? No. Can you hide from God? No. Does He already know what you've done? Yes. Does He know where you're at? Yes. But we still, in our shame, we hide from God. Those of you who are parents, have you ever come home and found that one of your children did something they weren't supposed to? Lamp got broken, dishes weren't done, whatever it is, and you can't find your child. They've gone to hide somewhere because they know when you find them, they're in trouble. You see that with kids. What I'm amazed at is you find it in animals, too. I've seen these videos online, and a lady walks into the living room, and the couch has been absolutely shredded, and there's filling from the cushions everywhere. And obviously, she has a dog. And the dog is the only one that's been home all day. And the dog is hiding under the table. Or the dog is laying there, and when she says, what did you do? The dog takes its paws and goes, <laughs> shame, secrecy. Sin separates you from God. Not because God is disgusted by you. Not because God wants to keep you away. But because we convince ourselves He doesn't want us. 
Or we convince ourselves we're not good enough for God. Well, the fact is, we're not good enough for God. That's why He had to send Jesus. That's why Jesus died for you and me. That's why Jesus paid the price, because we can't pay it ourselves. And so Jesus came. This is the same pattern what Eve went through and Adam went through. It's the same pattern that happens in our lives. God gives us instructions. We're tempted. We sin. We're ashamed. We hide. When God shows up to Adam and Eve, He asks them two questions. He asks them two questions. And I believe these questions are so important for me and for you. We need to answer these questions. If we want to find freedom from the sins that keep tripping us up, we've got to answer these questions. Let's look at Genesis 3, verse 9 and verse 13. The Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And the Lord God asked the woman, What is this you have done? See, where are you? That's the question that we need to answer. Are you lost? Have you never accepted the forgiving work of Jesus on the cross? Are you still living in your sin and your shame? Where are you in relationship with to God. Are you one who has fallen away? You accepted the work of Jesus, but over time you have let the temptations and the cares and the stress of this world to pull you away. God says, Where are you? Won't you come back to me? I'm still here. Where are you? Do you have an ongoing, loving, vibrant, powerful, one-on-one -on -one growing relationship with Jesus because of what He's done for you? Where are you? Maybe you can say, I'm not in a good place. Or maybe you say, I'm afraid. I'm struggling. I'm lonely. I'm angry. I have sinful attractions that are pulling me. Could be all kinds of things. Where are you really at? What are you feeling? What are you thinking? This is the question God asks, and you need to answer it. You need to answer it to Him, and you need to answer it for you in your relationship with Him. And the other question is, what have you done? What have you done? You see, there's power in verbalizing what you're doing. James chapter 5, verse 16, explains this one to us quite well. Can we put that up there, please? Genesis, or excuse me, James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The urgent request of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. What have you done? There's great power in verbalizing. Go to God and say, God, I did this. Also, we go into another person and say, hey, I am struggling. I have done this, whatever this might be. Or I've discovered that I'm selfish and self-centered. I've discovered that I'm angry all the time. I'm dis I've discovered that whatever. And confess. And then have that person pray for you. 
Go to a person that you can trust. Go to a person that really and truly is a righteous person so that they, when they pray for you, it will be powerful and effective. Because you can go to just about anybody and say, hey, I got this problem. Pray for me. Well, if they're not, as James says, a righteous person, their prayer won't be very effective. And righteous doesn't mean perfect, and righteous doesn't mean sinful. Righteous means someone who has a full, ongoing, powerful love relationship with Jesus. When we have to be honest enough to admit to ourselves and to someone else where we really are and what we're doing, sin loses its power when we bring it into the light. I'm sure when I talked about these persistent sins, you knew exactly which ones apply to you. It can be all kinds of things. Are you willing to deal with them? Will you begin to deal with them today? See, Jesus wants to help you deal with them. Jesus wants you to overcome them. And you cannot overcome them without Him. Amen. What is it that our closing verse talks about? If we abide in Him, He provides the power to do anything. But apart from Him, we can't do squat. We need Jesus. Where are you? And what have you done? This is God's invitation for you today. And I don't know how you answer those questions. Where are you and what have you done? But you know. And if you're honest with yourself, you can answer these questions. Because God is the one asking, where are you? And what have you done? And this invitation time is your opportunity to respond to Him. You may want to come to the altar and pray. You might be one of those standing here, sitting here this morning saying, yeah, where am I? I'm lost. I don't know Jesus. I'm completely messed up. And I need to accept His forgiving work on the cross. I'm going to be standing down here if that's where you're at. And you can come to me and say, hey, I'm lost and I want to be found. I'm lost and I want to be saved. I need to be saved. And I will guide you and I will help you. This is about you and God. And as our praise team comes to lead us, we need to understand that the key is our relationship with Jesus. Our invitation song this morning is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Because when you look at anything else, you get off the boundaries. You break the boundaries. You get off track. You wind up with a train wreck. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love and for this day, for all that you have done for us. Lord, lead us and guide us. Help us to answer the question, where are we and what have we done? And help us to respond to you so that we can say, I am walking my life hand in hand with Jesus no matter what, always and forever. And what have I done? I've asked for forgiveness. I've grabbed a hold of Jesus and I'm never going to let go. Let those be our answers. And then help us to do it. Help us to understand your boundaries and how they enrich us. And help us to respond in love to those boundaries. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.